Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this UA Masterclass. Uh, my name is Oscar Clark. I'm here to uh, help act as moderator uh, for the folks at Bango uh, uh, with the, the guys at Pocket Gamer. Uh, I've been involved in the games industry for uh, far too long, as you probably tell by the greyness of my beard. Uh, and uh, during my uh, day, I'm the strategy, chief strategy officer for a publisher called Fundamentally Games. But enough of me. Instead, let us talk about the amazing panelists we have. Uh, and they're going to sort of tell you a little bit about their insights and their understanding of the possibilities of uh, UA nowadays in the current climate. So let's start off. Hago um, from Advertiser. Hago, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you know what is your interest in this sphere of um, you know uh, of UA? Hey guys, uh, it's good to be here, and I'm excited for this session. Um, I'm Hagop. I'm the founder and CEO of Advertiser. Um, we're a growth marketing agency for app developers and um, e-commerce companies. I've been in growth marketing for gaming for uh, nine years before I decided to start on my own journey. I was at Zynga before I joined or started my own company. So uh, what I'm interested in is um, uh, the future of the industry, where we're going, what can we learn from the past, what can we learn from some of the big changes that happened in the past couple of months and and how can we move forward and continue uh, uh, trying in a business that's kind of like going up and down at the moment. So I'm, I'm excited to have those conversations with you guys and share my thoughts. Yeah, it's not like anything's changed recently or anything. Oh, wait. Um, so with that in mind, let's move on to our, our next speaker, Alexi um, from um, uh, Addictive. Could you if, just introduce yourself and talk about what your perspective is in the UA space? Oh, oh I think you're on mute. Yeah. There you go. I, think you I should be. You Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. So uh, I was saying, yes, I'm, I'm Alexi. I'm the US Managing Director for Addictive. Uh, we're the leading uh, app retargeting company in the world. And uh, we, you know, we help uh, companies uh, increase re revenue and retention through retargeting campaigns. And the reason I'm really excited about, you know, both the panel and the topics uh, today is, you know, with the recent changes, uh, we see every uh, potential hurdle as iOS as an opportunity and, and someone will find new niche, new opportunities uh, to create. And that's, uh, that's really what we're looking to do. And uh, we're looking to help as many people as possible adapt to this new world. Um, so a lot of, a lot of things ahead and I'm excited about the panel today. Fantastic stuff. Uh, Brett, uh, Brett in, in, from Bango, uh, could you introduce yeah. yourself and tell us a bit about what you guys do? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, Oscar, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Brett. I, I run the Bango Marketplace, uh, which is a division of Bango. We produce and share custom audiences for Facebook. We uh, offer these audiences to other mobile app advertisers to target not just new users, but new users who are going to become payers in your apps which is, I think, really the, um, the focus of monetization across the, uh, the, the app e ecosystem. And prior to Bango, uh, I ran strategic partnerships at a company called Bidalgo, which is a uh, global Facebook marketing partner. And I've been, so I've been in the business for, uh, for quite a while now, too, probably about 10 years or so. The thing that really I find most interesting about it is that it's incredibly fluid. Uh, it's not just, yeah, the iOS changes that are <clears throat> somewhat recent, but it feels like every, every few months is a something brand new, some crazy new hurdle that we got to navigate. And um, that, that I think finds it, keeps it very exciting and me personally very interested. And I'm looking forward to kind of deep diving all that today. Great stuff, thank you, Brett. Uh, uh, Hannah uh, from Uptime, can you introduce yourself and tell us all about what you do? Of course, hello everybody. Thank you for watching and thank you to Bango and Oscar for having me here. Um, about me, I look after the marketing at Uptime, which is an ad tech, EdTech app based in London. It just launched in January, but I've been working with apps and in, in you know in that whole tech app ecosystem for the last decade. So for those of you who haven't heard of Uptime yet, uh, we take books, courses, and documentaries and condense 
the learnings down into five minute hacks so that you can get the important bits really quick. And as a company, we're really interested in how people are hacking themselves. So biohacking using creams and going to like float tubs and things like that, but nothing similar has happened yet for your brain. Um, but then about me, I've, of course, on top of working uh, uptime, I've been mentoring and coaching companies. So I've worked with about 200 different companies. I have mentored with Google on their Launchpad program. I won App Marketer of the Year. And on top of that, I run a consultancy ho focused on helping early stage apps, you know, get going and or ha or other companies launching apps uh, into their into their ecosystem. Uh, I'm really excited today to, I mean, learn from everyone else on the panel, but also kind of bring that B2C side um, and perspective in. So. Cool. Uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I should probably explain a little bit about kind of my background for those who don't already know. Um, so I was about the original evangelist for what became Unity Ads uh, back in the day. So I was right at the start of what Rewarded Ads became. Uh, I'd been running games and services for like since 1998. I even wrote the book on the subject. Um, I, but probably more interesting, some more recently, I've been dabbling with a few things like we've just been doing some experiments using Steam based um, targeted ads. We've also been looking at um, audio ads and various other things. So I always keep abreast of what's going on. That's why I'm interested in this space because there's so much possibility. And boy, do we have a lot going on right now. Um, obviously, we've had one of the most kind of peculiar experiences of, 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 human history in the last you know 18 months or so um and the change of behavior which has been very much precipitated around online experiences and obviously games are a key part of that and and apps are obviously part of that process as well but at the same time most recently we've had the interesting uh, rise of the concerns over privacy and the gdpr and all these other kind of tools that are suddenly becoming uh, really key and important and the most noticeable elephant in the room being apple Apple and their removal of the IDFA, ID for advertisers, and the implementation of their ATT, their, um, uh, I can never remember what ATT stands for, but it's supposedly about transparency. Um, so what an amazing array of things that we've got to deal with at the moment. Now, the way we're gonna do this is we, I'm gonna ask questions of our panelists, but you can ask questions too. So please feel free to use the button that says ask a question. I'm gonna try and answer some of them as we go along, but we'll cut, we'll spend some dedicated time at the end of the webinar to go through those. So please feel free to use that process. Okay, so without further ado, um, what I'm gonna do is start off with, uh, let's, let's start with Alexi. Alexi, what do you think has been the biggest challenges over the past 12 months, and particularly the specific change? I've mentioned some of them, but for you, what's the sort of biggest thing that you think that um, you know, people in the audience should be paying attention to? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, you know, on, on the, the the iOS topic has brought a lot of questions and it has brought a lot of uh, shifts in priorities. So that's been our number one struggle is, uh, okay, all of a sudden you need to, you know, experiment experiment with uh, SK Network postbacks. You need to understand what your Android strategy versus your iOS strategy. You need to understand, okay, how much do I want to invest in predictions versus deterministic data? Um, how large is my data set and is it accurate and large enough to be able to, you know, to be able to make predictions. So those are some of the struggles that a lot of advertisers are going through right now. And, uh, and that we really, uh, you know, felt, uh, on the other side of the table. Um, and I think the top, the top one just being, okay, we need to reinvent the whole optimization, uh, uh, journey and look at, you know, a top funnel, essentially top funnel, like CPI optimization back in just like in 2012 or 2013, uh, which is probably the biggest challenge we're seeing right now. Yeah, it's almost like all of the things we've learned how to do efficiently, we can't do anymore because we can't retarget in the same way we once were able to. Uh, and there's pros and cons to why that is. Uh, Brett, um, for you, what is the, uh, uh, do you agree with those targets, those issues, or are there other angles on it you'd like to suggest? Yeah, I mean, 12 months in mobile app user acquisition is like a lifetime to cover. But <laughs> as a topic that's new, I think actually I would look at the introduction of artificial intelligence and where it's running. And, and that kind of manifests in a few different areas. One, of course, is just AI to run campaigns. But I think a more interesting one is AI to um, 
to really analyze creative performance. And I think if you have, if you distill all of the various factors and levers and targets and mechanisms to make a campaign successful, I think creative is probably the one that has the most impact. And there's some pretty cool new technology on the market that allows you to analyze creative and, and its performance. And that I think is something that I'm personally very ambitious and bullish about that um, has kind of come onto the scene that is worth really investigating and spending time with as, as a company who's, you know, if you're running marketing and UA campaigns, invest in this as a category. This is something I think is really going to pay off and it is a, is a really, really, really interesting, very current change. Yeah, I think it's it, it fascinating. I remember when we were starting to use back in the early days, levels of machine learning in terms of behavioral targeting. But of course, that's all reliant on some of the things we no longer have. So switching that that mm. prioritization to creative assessment, I think is absolutely smart. I have seen some really interesting kind of initial things, even for game design, using AI to try and assess some of those questions. Anyway, enough of me, me talking. Um, I, I go, uh, do you want to uh, describe to you what you think are the kind of top things? Are there anything additional or do you want to reinforce something that others have said? Yeah, just a detail on uh, what my counterpart uh, mentioned specifically when it comes to the creative. Obviously, um, the industry is moving towards automation with automation, like we're seeing now Facebook doing AAA, which is similar to UAC. Um, there's less of control over what we can do. What we still have control over is the creative, so creative is king. So uh, definitely it's something that um, I would expect to see more of the marketing being focused on that. But to, to the question of the last 12 months, what has changed the challenges? Um, I think um, before getting into the challenges, definitely I want to emphasize that last 12 months or specifically 2020 was a year of growth in app marketing. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the market of new merging countries that I'd be more than happy to share with you guys on some of the upcoming ones that marketers should pay attention to. Um, but obviously Apple, as you mentioned, is often in the room, came with side DFA and ATT prom and scat the work and like, oh, we're going to change this. We're going to uh, kind of like um, uh, create this idea then, basically. Um, obviously, the challenge was a lot of marketers um, saw this as a problem saw this as a problem that this is end to user acquisition or marketing. Uh, from my perspective, I don't think it's, an, it's the end because we thrived in the past 10 years with all the changes that happened. But you mentioned very well in the beginning that we're in an industry that every month there's something new. So every time there's something new, we're adapting to that change. Um, so with iOS 14.5 and a SCAT network, there are some of works that are being done and there are a couple of ways that we are still uh, experimenting to see how we can drive uh, a measurement the accurate way, uh, which, which I'll, I'll be more than happy as well to dive into those. Um, but, but my whole point is this is not the end of the world. There's still marketing budget being spent across the industry. And it's just, it's just changing the way how we're doing business. That's, that's all it is. It's just changing the game. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really important point, isn't it? We've had, as Brett said, as you know, as we all said, there is an ongoing nature of change, you know, three month cycle, whatever you want to call it, that seems to affect us. And the fact that we have to adapt anyway means that we are just adapters. That's the by very nature. I do wonder though whether um, what this is doing is actually kind of make, reminding some of us about the value of sort of longer term marketing, more brand building as well. I think there's some. Maybe not exact um, correlation because direct, you know, uh, response marketing is so effective. But I think that we've got to look at the shadow, the, the consistency, and how we can use kind of other means, other channels to support our direct response behavior. That's my opinion. But Hannah, do you have anything you wanted to add to these challenges we face, or kind of views upon that? Yeah, I mean, definitely, all of the points raised are completely valid. I mean, the last twelve months have been a bit of a roller coaster, but then as as everyone has said, it's constantly a roller coaster in UA. Um, I've seen some of the best results I've ever seen in the last 12 months, but I've also seen some of the worst results in the last 12 months that I've ever seen. So, I mean, and again, automated app ads being uh, Facebook's answer to the universal app campaigns from Google. Uh, I think, you know, we're moving towards this automated world and I'm always rabbiting on about this creative first approach that we should be doing now. Whereas, it, you know, previously it was all, 
uh, audience first. Who, who are people into ballet? Let's target them with ballet ads. Are people into bowling? Let's target them with ads about bowling. But now, you know, you target everyone with the bowling and ballet. Ad. I don't know. I'm talking about bowling and ballet, but <laughs> you hit them with the same ads, and then you see what works with broader audiences. You know, and then you're learning more about your audience that way, rather than trying to segment people based on something that they might have liked ten years ago. Um, but yeah, and I mean, on top of that as well, with the with the latest changes, you know, we're looking a lot at just blended costs and doing a lot of incremental testing and increasing budgets and seeing, you know, where things are falling down or or, or popping up. And, you know, it's, again, a lot of experimenting with our internal stuff. So, yeah, and it's it's it's. I think the key thing that I'm picking up and, and I'm, as I'm trying to do some of this work with, because we're testing games all the time, uh, um, it's, we have less fine detail we can look into, but that doesn't limit the scope of our, our possible choices, if that makes sense. So we're having to look for softer variables like emotion, like story, um, you know, if that makes sense. And, and just thinking about, again, I think this is, in some ways, this is a positive because we don't just get stuck in the maths, we start more thinking about the emotion. And I think the more we think about emotion, the better we are as creatives anyway. So we've talked about challenges. Let's talk about what the opportunities we think are coming out. Um, so Alexa, uh, do, you, do you want to sort of um, uh, give us a sense um, from you, what you think are the sort of the most interesting uh, opportunities that have arisen over the last you know, 12 months or so? Yeah, um, you know, I, I touched upon briefly. I mean, uh, you know, Brett mentioned the creative, and I'm, I'm fully in line that that's probably one of the biggest opportunities out there. Um, I, I I do think that uh, you know when we talk to advertisers and app developers, the number one sort of um, uh, opportunity we see is okay. Well, uh, and again, number one, number two, whatever, but but somewhere on the top is. Um, okay, I don't have deterministic data. How can I use my existing data set to run, you know, to, to predict what's going to happen at the user level? And we've done, if you think about it, we've we've done predictions. Not we as a company, we as a as an industry, we've done predictions forever. If you think about, hmm. you know, day thirty ROAS, that day thirty ROAS is really only there. To as a proxy for a day, you know, three sixty five or a day one eighty ROAS. So we've always done these predictions, but they're aggregate at the channel level or at the campaign level. And uh, and here I think there's a great opportunity to say, okay, well, you know, we can't, we can no longer have a deterministic data at the user level, at least for most people that don't give their consent to ATT. Um, however, we can run predictions on user. Um, uh, on user level and try to help advertisers um, understand a little bit more, a little bit faster, first of all, because you don't need to wait that 30 day window, uh, a little bit faster and a little bit more efficiently than SK network. Um, and, and so I think if we use that as a, as a framework for success, then, you know, I see advertisers measuring incrementality a lot more and I see advertisers investing more in, in predictions a lot more. Um, so that's that's where the opportunity for me is, and, and and where a lot of developers are are going right now. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. This idea that we've never predicted is is nonsense. We've always done it. We've always used proxies for that. We've just got privileged early in the last, you know few years where we could get this fine level of detail, much more level of detail than we've previously been able to get. The fact that we've gone too far for some audiences and they feel that's an invasion of privacy, that's fine. We've now stepped back from that. Um, I think we're always going to have an ebb and flow to find out what people are happy or not happy with. Um, so, Brett, what about for yourself? I mean, what do you think has been the biggest opportunity of the last 12 months? Yeah, I think, I think Alexi highlighted a really important point about predictive, um, predictive analytics. I mean, T ROAS on on Google is sort of that attempt to try to target a ROAS uh, figure. It, it's um, it's a really good observation. I I, I personally see kind of like a, I, I view this in a slightly different, less granular point of view. I, I think that um, we spend a lot of time targeting 
iOS users because they tend to monetize better. But in general, and especially more recently, because of everything, all the limitations on it, Android is a massive opportunity. And yes, I know that's half the market, so everyone's always mindful of it, but it's more important than ever before. The other interesting opportunity, if we can call it that, more of a trend, is just the movement away from, from games. I, I remember, you know, up until a few years ago, if you just took the top apps, you know, the vast, the vast, vast majority of them were just games. And it took, you know, you had to get below the first top 10 to ever see anything that wasn't a game. And that was then just Facebook. So just the proliferation of different kinds of apps. I think, you know, the very fact that the Hannah's coming here as an expert in, in a non-game app is really testament to that the 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 rise of e-commerce apps and social media apps and and education apps. It's it's a really really cool trend and absolutely an opportunity. Don't tell me there are other things than than games. Sorry, Sorry <laughs> my I'm life sure. choices are all wrong. No, no, I, I'm joking. But I mean, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I think Brett. I think this is this is really key. And I think we've seen traditionally this happen in many platforms where games show a structure and approach because of their accessibility that then gets taken up by other providers other other uh, and actually quite yeah. often surpassed by you know games I, I think that a lot of the 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 true experts in ua are born in games and all the best strategies are often there games are sort of the leader and then they take those skills and you go to the other other categories and that that, that could that's one of the explanations of why so many other uh, non-game apps are, are successful yeah, unfortunately, we get stuck in the gamification minefield. We're not going to go there. Don't worry. Um, uh, Hagar, uh, do you want to talk uh, about your perspective of the opportunities that you've seen over the last 12 months? And uh, if you've got any comments on what Alexia and Brett have said. Yeah, um, just a technical question. Can you guys hear me fine? Because it's telling me uh, there's a connection issue. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, we, we're losing you camera-wise occasionally, but uh, we can hear you fine. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I think from an opportunity perspective, I definitely I want to uh, break it down into uh, four pieces. Uh, one of the first is from a measurement perspective uh, related to iOS 14 and SCAD network. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities that a lot of companies are leaving on table is the ATT prompt. Um, you still have an opportunity to select the IDFA, uh, your user level data. Uh, that's going to be very key in for you to understand how your attribution is working for different channels. So I highly urge if, if companies haven't uh, uh, put the ATT framework into place, do it. Um, the average response rate into sharing the IDFA to track user data is 38%, which is pretty high for the industry. Um, so, so still, you can still use that data. You can still send that data to the different networks to be optimizing more effectively. Um, the other option is um, rely on first party data. Um, uh, you have data about uh, your users that are not related to the device. How can you take that data and use it into your marketing strategy? Um, so definitely that's something that I would consider. Um, and the way you can create sort of like your own attribution system instead of relying on uh, a SCAD network or your MMP partner. Um, and lastly, incrementality. Uh, Hannah, you mentioned about our incrementality. So there's a lot of ways where you can do incrementality to say how effective is, are my campaigns? How effective is my marketing budget uh, even after having some uh, attribution hurdles? There's a lot of companies out there, if you're not able to do incrementality yourself, they are offering that service. One of them is being Metricworks, and, and they'll tell you exactly how much effective your uh, each of the marketing campaigns how effective is uh, when you're running an increase in your budget what's impacting on your organic so definitely that's something that i would say look into it um the second piece i would talk about the marketplace uh, i mentioned in the early in the conversation that there's been a lot of changes in the past 12 months in 2020 there's a lot of uprising countries and regions that that it's surprising to see from a revenue perspective and more so marketplace growth perspective. Obviously, APAC is still being one of the largest market beside US, but some of the upcoming markets in the top 20 are Saudi Arabia, uh, Thailand, Russia, France, Italy, 
Spain, Netherlands, and Switzerland. So if if you're an international business, if you're a game or any app that you're offering, you have an opportunity to go uh, worldwide, definitely consider those markets. Now, uh, year over year, country and region growth that saw the most significant spike over the last 12 months, those countries are Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Chile, Philippines, and Egypt. So a lot of Arabic regions are growing in the market. And also uh, Saudi Arabia's government made a big announcement that in by 2030, they will be investing $200 billion in tech. So definitely, if you have an opportunity to go in the market and be an early comer, take advantage of that. Uh, besides that, the third point would be new channels. There's a lot of emerging new channels coming out in the market, um, such as uh, Reddit, TikTok, uh, Telegram, Pinterest. Always, always, always test, even if you're not sure that this might not work for you, but you might see some uh, hidden gems in those channels that you can take advantage of it. Um, and lastly, about the marketing. I think one of the big changes that's happening with today's world is, is also we see this a lot happening that a lot of people ask you, what's your title? Are you a user acquisition manager? Or are you performance marketing manager? Or are you growth marketing manager? I think what the industry is moving towards from being for only focused on user acquisition to becoming as a whole marketing uh, uh, individual. What I mean by that is you're not only just focusing on bringing people through the door through user acquisition strategies, but also focusing on the user journey how can you get more of the users how can you engage the user so uh, at us at um, uh, advertiser what we're focusing on our individuals and we're preparing each individuals not only to focus on being expert at facebook buying but also understand the user journey how can we impact in the life cycle marketing of the user work with the product to understand how can we increase the ltvs and lastly organic uh, we have an attribution problem today. Obviously, we're going to fix this in the future. However, organically, there's a lot of opportunities on the table that you can take advantage of. ASO is a big one. Uh, uh, work on making your product visible in the marketplace to help you drive organically your growth and find other creative ways where you can organically bring in more users, incentivizing those users. So. I think I covered a lot, but but a lot of these <laughs> points are pretty important that that we can take advantage of. But I think what you're highlighting is, uh, well, I, I should say I'm old enough to remember the first time around when we talked about integrated marketing, and it kind of disappeared when we could do direct response. And I feel like we're now back at that. And uh, next thing we're going to start hearing people saying the word synergy a lot and, and getting very <laughs> complained at. Uh, Hannah, um, do you have any thoughts on what uh, was just said? Or do you have any other sort of thing, other opportunities that you think we should be focusing on as well? Totally. I mean, hang up. That was so comprehensive. I mean, <laughs> we will end the whole panel now. But um, yeah, I'm we're gonna, done now. We're done. <laughs> But um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. I'm, what I have found the biggest opportunity over the last couple of months at least has been is just really zooming out. And as I was talking about before with this creative first approach, really just getting a lot more creative with what we're doing. So, you know, really th getting in touch with our customers and talking to them, understanding their psychology, getting really close with them and, you know, finding out what their you know jobs to be done are. Why are they actually using our product? If they don't use our product, why aren't they using our product? You know, what were they doing when they found out about it? And then really dive into that and pull out your themes, pull out, you know, the reasons why or why not, what are their anxieties and their motivators, and then really start to create messages which are really tying into that which i think you know we got very lazy over the last couple of years we're like this is what works you know lots of <laughs> ads <laughs> here's what's working but now we can zoom out and be a lot more creative um and then as well as that similar to what hagop was saying you know having worked with brands that can grow worldwide there is an opportunity for that i've been doing a lot of worldwide targeting you know pulling out your core geos but then you know targeting the rest of the world because you know with when you're getting revenue it doesn't really matter where it's coming from when you're a digital product so you know targeting with facebook um automated app ads you can just click uh, worldwide now <laughs> targeting which is super easy um and then just like 
get rid of any countries that, which aren't performing well or which where you're spotting some fraud because there's always going to be some kind of fraudulent cards <laughs> or card spoofing and things like that but you know get more creative and target the rest of the world mostly. I, th I think that's all good I don't think I think I'd add as a kind of publisher because I'm so focused on living games I think what's what's often forgotten about from the kind of um, the, the developer point of view is that actually what we want to do is keep as many of those players as possible so actually whilst UA is a massively important thing so is retention and actually part of retention can also help drive UA in my opinion and we do that by creating a network effect inside our experience. And the more that we can create this sensation of belonging, I mean, genuinely, we're not talking about going back to 2007 and Facebook games where we sell our friends for, you know, corn <laughs> in Facebook. Um, I'm talking about where you miss not turning up and you feel like you've let your side down or the member get member strategies that we, again, used to do when we were looking at more collective experiences back in the day. So for me, integrating is the key word and taking the ua strategies we've talked about but integrating that with you know other marketing activities social activities and why you're not using your your live experience to drive what your ua campaign looks like mm -hmm. that to me is a key to that as well i i, I just want to add something to that if you don't mind um when we were, i just love what you were saying before about you know building those network effects because like when you're thinking about the principles of influence and the principles of persuasion one of them is reciprocity and something that yes. i'm seeing time and time again now is that you know you're using that kind of uh, social capital like I'm building my social capital by inviting someone to something I'm not getting anything else you know it's just like I've got a golden ticket and I've chosen you so that's a really great technique that a lot of companies are doing which has been super successful Calm did that Monzo did that you know every, everyone's doing it <laughs> and if you haven't read um, uh, Robert yeah. Caldini's book Influence You Must it's an absolute you know necessity yeah. as is uh, Dan Aaron is predictably irrational but that's another subject um, I'm going to move on now to. Uh, more, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Oscar. It's sorry, Oscar. Stop you there. So yeah, one more thing to add on what you've mentioned is um, I think one of the common mistakes we see a lot in the gaming industry uh, is that a lot of those gaming companies and product developers they focus on the only high LTV users and try to shape a product only for those. Uh, but then you're missing on the part of those that might be in for free but they still want to love your product, engage in your product. So the answer to that, ad monetization. Ad monetization is still uh, a, a big part of the marketing strategy that should be for a lot of uh, publishers. So definitely I would say, not only focus on your LTV users, but also focus on the highly engaged users and see how you can monetize those users. I'd actually go further than that. So we're starting to be much more careful about the use of any kind of exchange, including soft currency, um, because what we're finding is that if you can sustain an audience for a period of time and you show them the promise, in fact, we're, we're, instead of saying MVP, we're now saying minimum viable promise, on the principle that if you establish the foreshadowing of why spending later will be valuable, then building up the momentum with all audiences can be valuable. And in particular, where you don't look to necessarily just have the highest super engaging, where you look at super engaging audiences at any level, you know, if I can get somebody to spend a dollar once a month, that's better than spending nothing. If I can get them to spend $5 every month, even better. So you're looking to create a trajectory of velocity, in my mind, for those engaged audiences, whatever that is, whether it's through ads or through in-app purchase, or even just creating that social media. Okay, so um, let's talk about different UA strategies that we think are going to come out of the, in the future. Um, so, uh, Alexa, let's start with you. Um, what what are the kind of you think are the next steps, the next kind of approaches to kind of app monetization and app um, uh, and UA, sorry, in particular? Um, what do you think is going to be the primary focus moving forward? I mean, it's interesting. What what uh, you know. Um, so some of the things that have been shared previously on the panel, um, if we look at, you know, low LTV users and Android users, like historically, we've always thought of Android as, okay, lower LTV users. And, and now we realize, okay, well, it might be better for, um, 
for app developers to invest more on Android. And what this iOS shift made us realize, and hopefully a lot of people realize that is, you know, it's always tough to have to be dependent uh, on a platform. And so right now, up until today, a lot of advertisers and you know, app developers were dependent. Um, you know, they were tied to, or, or their fate was, uh, let's say, uh, controlled by Apple. And what we see on the UA side now is, is both an opportunity to sort of what's coming ahead is, um, you know, new platforms and uh, how do we, you know, and how do app developers break the dependencies to large platforms out there? So, you know, one example of that is uh, streaming. Um, we've seen what Epic has, you know, gone through um, with uh, with Apple, and they've decided to partner with NVIDIA, and I believe it's NVIDIA, and uh, partner up to stream their titles. And they have much less uh, restrictions, and, you know, fewer restrictions and rules to, to play with. Uh, so they can, they can be free to develop whatever they want and the experience that they want to provide to their users. So as I look into the future for UA, I'm really excited about new platforms, streaming platforms in particular. And a lot of companies have tried that in the past, but I think the market has, you know, was way too early. If you think about, you know, something as simple as Facebook Instant Games, uh, the first time they released the platform, none of the tools were available to, or none of the tools that a marketer would expect to have were available to them. And the platform was really bad at monetizing uh, three, three years ago. It was really bad at monetizing, so it was really hard, very few tools available, and very low monetization. So made the platform essentially useless for a lot of developers. Um, right now, Facebook monetization has become much better. The tools have been added, and now it's becoming a real alternative. So you could say, okay, well, you know, we're just breaking the dependency to Apple, but we're becoming dependent to Facebook. And that's why I think streaming pl owned, owned uh, streaming platforms um, are going to be a very interesting play for a lot of app developers to try to distribute their titles through something other than the App Store or the Play Store. And that's where um, I'm, you know, uh, very bullish on for the future for, for UA. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, you mentioned streaming platforms in particular. Uh, I'm so full in with Xbox Game Pass now. Um, you know, it's on my PC, it's on my phone, it's on my iPad, it's everywhere. And um, I'm almost kind of not sure I'm going to turn my Xbox back on again. But that's another subject. Uh, Brett, uh, what about yourself? How do you think about different approaches uh, moving forward? I mean, obviously, yeah. I'm sure you have a view on that. Yeah, here's an interesting one. Um, releasing an app in Spanish. Um, I, I know it's kind of not the, the uh, opportunity most people are thinking about or anticipating, but the US alone has like 40, 41 million Spanish speakers, like 10 to 12 million bilingual speakers. It's one of the world's largest Spanish speaking countries, but we, it's kind of a market that's not really, um, uh, it's overlooked. It's, we don't, we don't really think that we think of it. Everything is in English. And I think it's, a, it represents a really, really big opportunity that is, uh, not being exploited, having not just creative in Spanish, but just having an app, everything that you do, port it to Spanish and releasing it in the US. I think that's uh, a really, really big opportunity that I have not seen done. Yeah, I, I just, we talked about MENA earlier. If you think about the 400 million Arabic speakers out there, right. one of the things that people don't necessarily know is that uh, the second largest revenue generating country in the world for PUBG on mobile is Saudi Arabia. And in fact, it's something like four to five times the revenue per capita in Saudi Arabia. That's just like blew, blew my mind when I found that out. I look, I, th I think we all have a bias to market to ourselves and, you know, American English speakers market to other American English speakers. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the pattern. Uh, it, it's just a huge opportunity that is not being captured. And I, I think um, I got a list of other countries earlier that you know I've, I've never really thought about you know looking to, to go to Chile to market or to go to uh, some of the what we call them tier three countries that there's this you know maybe 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 you do a test launch there just to kind of check the viability or monetization loops but um, there's just a lot of a lot of people there and they're 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 happy to be great users and great monetizers in your app 
No, I completely agree. And actually, there was a period of time when the iPhone was still relatively new, where a lot of studios were still targeting Java games in the third tier countries very successfully for quite a long period of time. Amazingly long period of time, actually. Hago, um, so for, you, for yourself, um, what what do you think are the kind of next strategies we should be considering? Yeah, I want to detail what Brett said. Um, I 200% agree. Uh, with what Brett was mentioning. Um, there's some companies out there that they are doing the job, but they're not doing the job 100%. What I mean by that is that they're translating the app in the in the in in different languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. Um, um, however, one of the things that they're thinking about is focusing on cultural localization. Uh, not every country in Latin America is the same. Each one has a different way of speaking. They have different way of interacting with messaging. So they have a different strategy. Simplize in the US, like if you're if you're advertising to someone in LA versus in your New York, they have different cultures. So focus on showcasing your message that applies to the culture of the region versus saying, oh, I did my job, I translated this into the language that I had to translate, and let me see if that works. Um, if, another opportunity, I think, uh, or how I see the future of UA is, 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 is that transition, of, as I mentioned earlier, from just focusing on bringing people through the door, now being through the whole funnel, like from A to Z of the user journey, understanding how can you have an impact on the users? And, and what are some of the strategies that you can do to impact on this, whether if it's through user acquisition or through product. So connect the dots. Definitely, I would say connecting the dots between the two. Now, I'm seeing a lot of interesting questions out there in the market in terms of NFTs or what are some of the... Definitely, Metaverse is something that's boiling at the moment. There's a lot of companies that are very much interested in, in Metaverse and NFTs. Um, I do believe that's uh, something that could become a big part of the future. Um, uh, whether if you can make it part of your own existing business or you enter into the blockchain business. However, it's still a new market. So a lot of people are skeptical about it or they don't understand the technology, hence they pull back. However, I do see a lot of companies who are making it a little bit more simple for uh, the, the, the consumer to understand the simplicity of this and and and, and, and have added value to your business. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, know, you mentioned stories about that uh, in particular because um, I was actually one of the uh, designers on a, a game that was very early in the NFT space, uh, designing uh, an um, AR GPS location game, uh, which had uh, blockchain-based. Uh, hey, can you can you please uh, explain to us what, what what on earth does all this mean? Because I'm I'm pretty confused by it all. Well, let's let Hannah ask ask, ask the que original question first, and then let's get okay. back to the blockchain. Because I could I've literally hosted. Day-long conferences on blockchain, so <laughs> I know we can get right Yeah, definitely. Cool. So, Hannah, so to give you a chance as well on the original question, i.e., um, how would you take a, a different approach to kind of UA in the future? Do you have any kind of things you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I've been working with subscription apps for the last little while now, and, you know, previously everything that we've been doing has been, you know, Download the app, sign up, here's your subscription window. Like take out your seven day free trial, give us your credit card details right away. And what we're doing now is testing a lot more around, let's give everyone a free experience right away. Give everyone unlimited access to everything. Let them come in, experience everything, and then really sell it to them once, once you start to restrict things from them. So also building out new features. So we're just releasing um, dark mode as a premium feature, for example, because that's our most requested uh, feature in the whole for from the whole audience so we're just going to put that behind the paywall and things like this so you know what what are the things that people really want and really need and then you know monetize based on those I would say I that's think that's a really interesting point though because what you've highlighted there is I wouldn't put think of putting dark mode because that's a thing that is become a thing mm -hmm. uh, so there's an expectation in my head because I'm familiar with it, that it would be part of the process. But mm -hmm. what you've highlighted is that there's a value add that people actually wanted. But let's give it to them, but let's give it to them in a way that makes sense in terms of commercial of the game. And I, th exactly. I think that's very smart. 
Exactly. It's dark mode, it's downloads, it's yeah. saving things and things like that. What are the things that are important for people? And then putting those behind the paywall instead of just restricting usage. Whenever <laughs> your goal, your goal is always to get usage, you know, you, you know, I, I've made the mistake in the past where we're, th we're saying, you know, oh, we'll restrict usage and put that behind a paywall, be but then you don't give people the opportunity to become hard active. So let them become hard yeah. active and then restrict the bits that they need for it to maximize their experience. I, I, I couldn't, but uh, this is, the, we still get this issue in games where designers don't understand what the point of free to play is. The free to play bit isn't that we don't want people to pay. It's not that. It's about we value retention. And valuing retention, you know, first and foremost, I think is absolutely really critical to understand these business models nowadays. And I think what you said there is like really getting under the bones of actually, if I don't put things in people's way, if I create this as part of their habitual behavior, as part of their their lifestyle choice, their, the way they identify themselves, that is a transformational business relationship as well as something that requires honesty and kind of genuine support and care for the, the consumer, the player, or the, or the experience of, of the game. Totally. Uh, I also think it's a great chance to get back to Brett's question, which was about blockchain and what explaining what blockchain is. So, Hugo, did you want to have a quick kind of go at explaining what role blockchain has in terms of kind of this commercial side of things? I'm happy to, but I'm sure you'd like to say better, probably better from you. Yeah, uh, it's definitely it's a, it's a question that can be very broad. And like, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we can talk about this for an hour extra if we need to. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things that I would um, uh, put it out there when related to the NFTs and blockchain is that um, uh, we as a marketer, we're always aiming for customized experience for users. Um, that has always been the case from the 60s and before time and until now. Uh, one of the things that I do see a huge opportunity that we can take learning from NFTs and maybe we can apply it outside of the blockchain world is the customization aspect of the user experience. What I mean by that, let's take an example that you are an RPG game and me as a user, I create my own avatar and my avatar is stronger than my other competition in the game because I've been upgrading this first individual character and, and crushing it, right? Um, with NFTs, you can what you can do is you can make this avatar sellable. You can make this avatar something that you can uh, uh, duplicate, make copies of it, and sell it in the market on the NFT world. Now, we can take this as a developer, as an experience of saying that maybe we can make this part of the economy. Maybe uh, instead of just using uh, relying on a blockchain in order to trade through the NFT, what if we take the same concept of having that customized experience for the user and sharing it with other people? So that's one of the things that I have to bring it out about NFTs. But again, there's so much to talk about NFTs. So definitely, I don't want to take the whole time to, to talk about it. Absolutely. And I think, unless anyone wants to make any kind of quick comments, it probably ought to move on to kind of some practical tips because I'm very aware that we've got... We've only got about 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that anyone leaving this session is able to kind of come away with something kind of the actionable that they can uh, take with them. Um, so what I'd like to do is just ask you each in turn, uh, and, and feel free to look at the questions that we've got, in particular, you know, TikTok and stuff like that. I, 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 I'd like to just get you to get give us give the audience a kind of quick, this is my top tip. That I'd like you to take away from this session. So, Alexis, you want to kind of uh, give us your top tip? Um, yeah, well, I have a, I have a strong bias towards games. A lot of our uh, revenue is made on, on gaming. So, uh, uh, you know, and actually, it, there's uh, for us who asked, you know, uh, given the current complexity of UA, is it practical for independent mobile game studio to attempt UA and develop the capability internally? And that's kind of linked to what I was going to say about. Um, uh, you know about uh, sort of an actionable uh, actionable tip, but the, the you know for for smaller studios, um, it's going to be hard um, because you don't have. It's harder to accumulate your first party data. It's hard to you don't have like the 
you know, you don't necessarily have the cash reserves and, and so on. Um, and there's going to be a lot of um, big gaming publishers that are going to keep acquiring. And, and actually, if you look at the M&A market right now, it's been, uh, you know, really hot for gaming studios. I believe the latest deal announced was uh, EA acquiring Playdemic and, and its title Golf Clash. Um, yeah. Maybe there's been new announcements since last week. I was actually uh, uh, removed from the news a little bit. But the the point I'm trying to make is um, smaller studios um, I think should look a lot more into, okay, how can we leverage larger studios for growth? Because larger studios have, you know, uh, the idea V available. They, they can create their own ad network based off their own titles and uh, they can cross promote a lot easier. So, you know, that's something I would look into. And, and for larger gaming studios, I would look into uh, or, or not just gaming studios, but any any company that's trying to build a portfolio of app and not just one app is really to look at cross promotion and to look at okay, I have a you know have a, a ton of inventory myself. If I have ten apps, uh, ten games, let's say I have a ton of inventory, I used to only use cross promo as whatever unsold inventory, remnant inventory. I'll use that for cross promotion. But now it's time to value that, that inventory that all of the large gaming studios have and promote much better their other titles. Better meaning, better targeting, better, better uh, capping, better just investing more into cross promotion since that's where you'll have a lot of deterministic data. So, um, so it's a different answer for smaller publishers and larger publishers. But one way or another, I think that we're gonna see a lot more M&A even more so than the last 12 months. I think it makes sense. Brett, uh, what's your perspective on this? What's your practical tip? Yeah, um, my recommendation is to make sure before you ever begin paid user acquisition campaigns that you have really, really clear and defined KPIs that are relevant for your app at your life cycle. Um, everyone, it, it's, it's not common, excuse me, it's very common for people to start paying user, paying for campaigns without having an idea of what success would look like for them. Like what should a day one, a day three, a day seven, day 30 ROAS target be, but not like in general, like specifically for your app and specifically for your app's life cycle point, which will be different if you're just launching it versus you're mature. Um, and I'm sure there's people out there who go, well, I have no idea what my target should be. Um, I'm, I, I know what I've been doing, but I don't know what I could be doing. So. Uh, I come from the Facebook marketing partner background. Call one of them. Say like, what should these are companies that, that have you know visibility to tons of apps in your category. Call one if if, if you're if you're using what partner now. Ask them what they're seeing. If they if they're not, interview some to get a good sense of what realistic targets should be for your app at this time. And if they don't give you good advice, then or you don't have any friends, then then call me and I'll help you figure it out too. But you gotta can you have share your phone. number. Can you show your phone number live, Brett? Sure. <laughs> Four five seven eight six one one two five. I'll be there calling you. you. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Make sure you know what you're it. going for. Make sure you know what success looks like. That's my advice. Yeah, I think that's a really important. Um, so we, uh, at, when we became publishers, so the key thing that let us do that is an arrangement with a, a finance company which we do UA testing with. So we have a, we can draw to do tests, and our tests start with simple hyper casual style um uh cpi tests even before the game's released it, sorry before the game exists i mean we then move on to doing ux testing with something like playtest cloud where we can basically get a net promoter score so until we've got our kpi for, for what we think cpi will be before we get a, 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 our kpi for what we think net promoter score should be we don't even do the beta test and then when we get to our beta test, we're looking for day one, day three, day 14, day you know, 30, before we even start thinking about scale. And we're talking about tiny amounts at that point. And then only when we know that we've got the level of day 30 we're after, do we start doing our ROAS testing. And if we get our ROAS testing, that's when we exit out of our test cycle. And only then do we start scaling marketing budget. So I think test and release strategies, KPIs are really critical. And I think we don't have to have a war chest necessarily. There are organizations out there. If you can prove your data will support your scaling. Um, sorry, enough about me. Hannah, um, you're, uh, do you want to tell us about your top tip, please? Me? Okay. Yes, please. I would say that, I mean, echoing what everyone else has already said brilliantly, but I would always say 
you know, you have to start gently and in a structured way when you're getting going and testing just one element at a time. So you can really understand what's working. So sometimes I'm starting to work with new clients and I look into their ad account and I'm like, what is this Frankenstein's monster? Like nothing makes sense. Everything is just, you know, creatives from all different years and no one knows why anything is working. So, you know, start with, if you even if you haven't got much design resource start with all the same image with just the text difference so you can test out your different messaging and in line with that whenever you're starting out any any new experiment make sure again as Brett was saying define what your success is in advance and it doesn't even need to be as as deep as you know your day whatever like it can just be that you're going to be targeting installs instead of clicks and things like this because time and time again I work with companies who spend a load of money and then aren't sure whether they should be looking at their installs or their purchases or their clicks or you know and thirdly in line with that I would say that look at all of those metrics whenever you're doing your creative testing because you're probably going to find that some of the messaging that you've tried which is getting really great clicks might not get such good conversions related on the funnel and that kind of creative and that kind of messaging might be really great for brand awareness campaigns because it's getting those clicks and it's getting those very far up top of funnel engagements that then you can build out a really big audience with and then retarget heavily with. So, you know, just start slowly and really structure everything. Absolutely. That makes absolute sense. Uh, Hago, do you want to tell us about your top tip? Yeah, um, uh, one of the things that I always say, a lot of people will say, well, is that it? Uh, is uh, it's marketing one on one. Always have that in mind that whatever you're doing by applying the technology, always use in your head the marketing one on one. Like that's what what it is all about. Like whatever you set up your strategy on Facebook, Google, the different uh, uh, products that you're going to use always can keep in mind the marketing one-on-one who's my audience when do i target them how do i target them um uh this we we talked about and i emphasize it again creative and localizing the creative and messaging for each region and culturally localization is highly important we're moving towards automation in the industry so you definitely want to have the right message uh ready to drive the highest best conversions second one is data skink you still want to analyze the data um, um, you want to understand your user behavior so from there you can understand how you want to set up your marketing strategy moving forward and lastly organic growth um, um, there's a lot of opportunity to grow organically be creative with it the app store optimization is a very important one don't neglect it always look into ways where you can improve your visibility in the app store so those will be my tips cool um, that's fantastic. We have literally like, two minutes left. I'm just going to ask the one of the, the, the top voted question we have at the moment. Uh, just to check, has anyone on the panel used uh, TikTok ads and do you have any sense of what the performance is on that? Anyone uh, want to yeah, that? I've used, yeah, 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 I've used TikTok ads. I think like they are not really offering any kind of credits or anything like that to get going, but I know that they've got some good discounts on at the moment. So, you know, it's easy to get set up. They integrate with any of your MMPs and the results are just, you know, they're not they're not overwhelmingly cheap or anything like that. You're just seeing kind of industry normal. It's not performing quite as poorly as, say, Snapchat what is because I feel like Snapchat, the costs are just phenomenal um <laughs> phenomenally bad um whereas with tiktok they're kind of more in line with what you'd, you'd see on facebook or, or google um I, i've got some friends who have had success with uh, tiktok uh, i've not done it myself <laughs> one thing they consistently say is you can't just stick an ad on it you've got to actually think about the experience and it's got to work with tiktok yep. it can't it's just be the any old flavor yeah. Yeah. the main difference with tiktok as well is that yeah. every other platform you're designing for sound off no, well not every other platform but for the main ones you're designing a sound off experience too because half of the people aren't going to be watching with sound whereas with tiktok everyone is watching with sound so you have to prioritize what it sounds like and the interaction that you're going to be getting with it 
Absolutely. And on that note, I think we're done. Uh, well, we're out of time anyway. Uh, so I want to make a, a, a you know, just a resounding thank you to all the panelists. It's been fantastic hearing you. And thank you guys for listening in. Um, one last chance, if you can, go and look at the poll. Uh, we'd be really keen to get your answer on basically the question, what percentage of your UA budget are you planning to switch from iOS to Android? It'd be great to know what your answer is to that, everybody. So with that in mind, Alexi, Brett, Hannah, and Hago, thank you so much for participating in this. Thank you to Bango and to Pocket Gamer for setting this up uh, and having me. And if anyone wants to get hold of us, I'm sure you'll be able to find our details around. Uh, you can't miss the hat if you're looking for me. <laughs> Thanks Thank for having, you for having us. This was Thanks perfect. for having me. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.